We're going to be in John chapter 21 today, John chapter 21. I'd like to thank you all for having me. Um, it's truly a blessing and an honor to get to be somewhere and preach God's word anywhere, and especially here. Um, I've had classes with Brother Dylan. Um, we've gone to school together. Um, bumped into his wife on the volleyball court the other day. Um, so I just, just see him all over the place. Um, and, and he truly has nothing but good words to speak about, about y'all, and he really brags about y'all. So when I got the opportunity to come, come here and preach, um, I, I had to take it. I was really excited to come and meet y'all since he bragged about you so much. Um, so we're going to be in John chapter 21. Uh, before I get started, I do want to say that I do deserve a pat on the back because I thought of so many Paris jokes that I wanted to make, but I'm like, man, they live here, they've heard them all, so I'm just not going to do it. And if you know me, man, it, it took a lot. I, oh, I, I had several lined up. Um, but John chapter 21, this morning I want to talk about, really, and this is going to sound silly, but this or that, right? In life, we have to make decisions all the time. Today, as, as already mentioned, you might already be thinking about what you're going to have for lunch today. Um, you're going to be like, man, I don't know about, about here in Paris. I didn't look up restaurants here, but I imagine there's probably a Mexican place here. I mean, I would assume so. And so you're like, well, do I go to Mexican or do I go to fast food? Or... And so you've got decisions to make, this or that. And we have decisions our whole life, this or that. And at some point in your life, you have to decide... Jesus or myself. And today we're going to read about an encounter where one of Jesus' apostles had to make a decision, this or that. And in John chapter 21, uh, we'll start in verse 1. Uh, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the sea of Tiberias, and on the wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called uh, Didymus and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and uh, two two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. All right, so we're going to do a little bit of background uh, information. Jesus has already been been uh, killed he's been put on the cross he's 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 died he's gone to the gone to the grave he's arisen he's shown himself this is the third time that Jesus is going to show himself to his apostles and well Peter good old Peter he looks at the other apostles and he says guys I'm going fishing and they said okay we're going to go with you and so they go out and I love this Um, something that we kind of skim over. In verse 3 it says, They went forth and entered into a ship immediately. There was a ship there on the bank ready and waiting for them. See, many of these men had been fishermen, not as a hobby as we know, but as their livelihood. Many of them, this was their job. And the thing that I want us to realize, and there's just this short little word here into a ship immediately, is Peter always had the capability to go right back to fishing. Do we know what that means? That means that Peter always had a plan B. See, I'm sure their their family was also fishermen. They had boats. This wasn't something where they went and rented a boat. I'm sure they owned their own boats. And so while they were with Jesus, maybe their brothers or their dad or their cousins were using that boat, but they still had their boats. And when things got tough, when Peter was up against a wall, when Peter didn't know what he was going to do, what did he always fall back on? He fell back on what he knew. He said, I'm going fishing. And the other apostle said, okay, we'll go with you. And that night they don't catch anything. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase some of these verses. You can read it. Um, they don't catch anything. And the next morning, a man comes out on the shore and he says, Hey, have you caught anything? They said, Nope. No, we haven't. Thanks for rubbing it in. And uh, the man says, Hey, throw your nets on the other side. And I'm sure they're thinking under their breath, oh, Okay, yeah, sure. Like we've been out here fishing all night long. We've done this for a living. And you're going to tell us to throw it on the other side. Okay. All right, buddy. And well, they're like, Well, we've got nothing else to do. And so they do it. And lo and behold, they catch probably more fish than they have ever caught in one haul before. And all of a sudden, uh, John, he's like, man, that's Jesus. 
And so, boy, they, they, come, they come on in. Peter, uh, oh, Peter. He dives into, the, dives into the water because he wasn't fully clothed and he was, felt awkward, so he dives into the water. He gets dressed. They, they come in, and I want us to look at, uh, at verse 8. And the other disciples came in on a little ship, for they were not far from the land, but as it was 200 cubits, dragging the net with the fishes. As soon as they were, they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. Jesus say, saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. I want us, to, I want us to, once again to kind of set the scene. They've been out fishing all night. They've been, they're, they're hot, they're sweaty. They've shedded their outer garments. You know, they're just out there working. Jesus tells them to cast on the other side. They, they bring this fit, these fish in, so much so that they're shocked that the net hasn't broken. They come in, they drag it in, and Jesus has a fire sitting there ready for them. And he says, hey, come eat. I've got breakfast for you. And something very interesting is there in uh, verse 9 where it says a fire of coals. That's only used two times in the Bible. It's used here. And by the fire, Peter was warming himself where he denied Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not saying that this is the only time Peter ever saw charcoal flames. That's not what I'm saying. But I find it very interesting that the only two times that this, this phrase of this type of fire was used, both times by John, and once here, and once in the fire. So I can just imagine as Peter walks up, and he smells this smoke, and he sees the fire. He remembers the last time that he smelled the smoke and saw the fire. Where before he was looking as Jesus was being ridiculed, as he was looking in, as he was standing afar off, as he was looking over the fire and through the smoke, and he saw his Savior being persecuted and ridiculed and arrested, and he was denying him. And here he is, looking through the smoke at his Savior on the other side. Now I want us to realize that not only was Jesus Peter's Savior and Lord, he was also his best friend. We've got to realize that, that this was not Jesus and his apostles, they were not some, this wasn't some stoic relationship where it was just constant straight face. There was no humor. There was no laughs. It was just, oh, Peter, how are you doing today? Yeah, good. All right, yeah. And it wasn't that. They lived life together for three and a half years. They walked together. They talked together. They ate together. In the, in the Sunday school lesson, Jesus came in and healed Peter's mother-in-law, which he might not have liked, but he did it, Right? I mean, he, he was in his own home. They had a love for one another. They were best friends. This was, this was Peter's man. And he denied him. Not once, not twice, but three times. Now, in Jewish culture, when, when somebody would walk, when a disciple would walk away from their teacher, that was that. There really wasn't any coming back from that. Even if you apologize and stuff like that, it was kind of one of those things that, okay, you've broken off. You've separated yourself from me. And so Peter, in his Jewish mind, he saw himself not only reject his Lord and Savior, but his best friend. Somebody who he had walked away from his life for three and a half years to follow, and he had thrown it all away. Now, I don't know about y'all, but there have been times in my life where I have fallen so hard where I knew I was supposed to stand for Jesus, where I knew I was supposed to tell people about Him, but instead I turned my back. I turned away and I did nothing. I said nothing. And sometimes rejecting Jesus, most of the time when we reject Jesus, it's not when we say, no, I don't know Him, but it's when we say nothing at all. When you're at school, when you're at work, when you're at your family's place, and they're talking about heartaches and hurt. They're talking about how life isn't okay. How they're going through it. And we never once mention Jesus. We never mention what he's done for us. That's most of the time what the rejection of Jesus in our life looks like. Just the simple fact that we don't even acknowledge him in our life. But here's Peter. He walks up. 
And he sees Jesus, he smells the smoke, he sees the fire, he sees the meal. He walks up and they eat breakfast. And then in verse 11 it says, Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of great fishes, 153. And for all they were so many, yet was the net not broken. Jesus saith unto him, Come and dine. And none of the disciples did ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and gave them and fish likewise. So they eat their breakfast. And then in verse 14, This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. Pretty interesting number. Third time. Third time Peter's seen Jesus since he, di- since he died. Since he came back. Just like how many times he denied him. In verse 15, So when they dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yeah, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yes, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith, feed un- uh, saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he saith un- said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou would. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt be stretched forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. Now I want to, I want to go back into verse 15. After, after they got done eating, Jesus goes to Peter, and he says, Simon, do you love me more than these? Now, in my mind, this isn't in the Bible. This is just my, my weird, weird imagination. I imagine that they were circled around this fire and they were eating. And one by one, they finished and they're sitting there talking with their Lord, sitting there enjoying each other's company. And while that's going on, I imagine Peter gets up and he begins to clean the net. I imagine he gets up and goes over and begins to, to do whatever work he needs to do with the fish because there is the, the apostles fellowshipping with their Lord and Savior. And Peter is sitting there with nothing but guilt in his heart for the times that he rejected his friend. And so he walks over to the fish and Jesus comes over and he asks Peter. He says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Now I've heard people say a lot of, thought of, a lot of things about the these there. But I 100% believe that these, the these here is talking about the fish. Talking about the fish that they just pulled in Standing over him that they just, just brought into the bank. Peter's standing over this, and this is his livelihood. A bigger haul than he's probably ever caught before. That's money. That's life. That's food. And Jesus asks him, he says, Peter, do you love me more than these? See, when things got tough, where did Peter go? Fishing. When things got hard, where did Peter go? Fishing. If things didn't work out, what was Peter's plan? Fishing. Now I have to ask you today, do you love God more than your backup plan? See, many times God's asking us to step out in faith and we say, okay, we will. And if it doesn't work out, I can do this. And if it doesn't work out, I'll do this. And so we always have a backup plan. Now I want to ask you, is that faith? Is that faith? Oh, Lord, I'll serve you, and I'm going to prepare just in case it doesn't work out. That's not faith at all. That's having a backup plan ready to leave at any moment. Those of you that are married, what if if on your wedding day, your husband or wife looked at you and you said, man, I love you so much. You hope they say that right. Say, I love you so much. If things don't work out, my ex Jenny, she's always ready. (laughs) Now, if they told you that, I'm sure whoever said that, man or female, would probably have a handprint across their face, right? That would, mm mm, no. I, hey, oh, preacher, we need to, we need to calm down with this wedding right now. I don't know if we're ready to go through with it. He's got Jenny on, on, on speed dial over there. No, thank you. But yet we do the same thing to God every single day, right? We have a backup plan, ready and waiting. 
Because Lord forbid, I go 100% in on Christ and then I have to live by faith. Then I'm not sure if things fall apart. Things just fall apart and I don't know what to do. Well, isn't that what faith is? Just not knowing, just trusting, just jumping and knowing that God will catch us. See, many of us have lived for far too long with a, with a plan B in our back pocket. And half the time we've got three or four plans. We've got a B, C, D, E. We've never once gone fully in on God. And a lot of the time it's because it's what we're used to. Peter lived his life a fisherman. He'd grown up a fisherman. I'm sure his, his family business was fishing. It's what he grew up around. It's what he was used to. It's what he was comfortable. And I'm sure he was good at it. And man, don't we use a lot of those excuses to not serve God? I've heard many, many guys who are called to the ministry, and they talk about why they turned it down for so long, right? Man, I had a good job. Had good money. There's not a lot of money in preaching. There's, it's not fancy. It's not exciting. All of these things. And you turn it down, and you, it, you get down to it, and it's just like, well, this is secure. This isn't. I want to ask you, what are you falling back on? Is it, is it your job? Is it school? Maybe it's even good things like family, right? Family's great. But if that's what you turn to instead of God, then... You're putting that in between you and God, and I'm sorry, that's a dangerous, dangerous thing to do. Putting anything between you and God is dangerous. Jesus came to Peter and he asked him, do you love me more than these? What is it in your life? I don't, I don't know you, you don't really know me, so I can't tell you. But you know. You know what thing it is that when it comes to serving God, this will always take precedence, right? I'm a, uh, I, I don't know y'all once again, so if I say something that, 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 that hurts, I don't know you. It wasn't directed at you, okay? But I'm a, I'm a youth pastor, so I deal with a lot of things. And I know there's a lot of things that we put in front of God. We'll have, oh, we'll have dedicated families. They're there every Sunday and Wednesday night until hunting season comes in. Until it's softball or baseball season. Until it's rodeo time. Until uh, family comes in. You know, you, you name it, we got it, right? So, parents, what are we teaching our kids? All right, God's, God's important until it's a softball game. Then your traveling softball team's more important, right? Important until it's a basketball tournament. Basketball takes precedence over, over God on this day, right? We make these decisions, and you're like, well, Kenny, Kenny, it's one Sunday out of the month. Okay, and what you're saying is the one time basketball interferes with church, basketball is more important, right? I was there. I was in high school. I was in all the sports. I mean, I don't look like it now, but I was. I was even halfway decent. I was in any activity you had. Everything. I don't know why. I just, I guess fear of missing out. I was an FFA. I was even president of FFA, beta, football, everything. Oh, boy, I was all in. Parents, kids, Jesus is asking, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than your sport? Do you love me more than finances? Do you love me more than your boyfriend or your girlfriend? Do you love me more than your job? Do you love me more than your husband or wife? Do you love me more than your kids? And when we get right down to it, the fact is, no, we don't. Because when I have a choice between serving God or going fishing, I'm going fishing. When I have a choice between making some more money at work or, or, or going and, and being a star or a stud in football or, or whatever... How many times does God take the, take the back seat? 
And you might be coming today and you're like, Kenny, I've turned my back on God so many times. I've betrayed him. He's my best friend. I've hurt him. I've grieved him. And I'm grieving. I'm hurt. Here's your opportunity. Because guess what? Because Peter had straight up denied Christ. As hard as anybody could ever do it, right? When we would say Jesus was at his lowest point here on earth, Peter turned his back on him. And I want you to know that Peter knew that. And I would say that you today that has guilt on your heart, you don't need me to tell you. You feel it. You know the guilt and the hurt you have in your heart, the times that you've turned your back on God. You don't need me to point it out. It's there. But what does Jesus do? He comes and he asks Peter, do you love me more than these? And he asks him three times, do you love me? Now this wasn't Jesus thumbing his nose at him. This wasn't Jesus putting his, you know, punching him in the back saying, oh look, I'm going to ask you three times to make you remember. No. This was Jesus' mercy. He asks Peter three times, do you love me? And every time... And the third time, Peter, oh, he was, he was grieved, and he says, Lord, you know, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, okay then, feed my sheep. You've denied me three times, I'm going to ask you three times if you love me. It's okay. That's gone. But I need you to feed my sheep now. And Peter came to a moment, this or that. Jesus or what he was comfortable with. Jesus, or what he knew. Jesus, or money. Jesus, or stability. And he chose Jesus. And I want to tell you from this moment on, now don't get me wrong, Peter wasn't perfect. We read farther on, on in the Bible that he still had things he had to overcome. But from this moment on, Peter was a changed man. He was a great, great servant of God. Pastor of... Church of Jerusalem, a huge, huge church, and he led a revolution for Jesus. So no matter where you are today, if maybe you say, Kenny, it's been 10 years since I've had a serious relationship with Jesus. I come to church, I act like I know what I'm doing, but I really don't have a personal relationship with him. I've turned my back on him time and time again. I don't know what I'm going to do. I want to tell you right now, Jesus is asking, do you love me? Do you love me? And if the answer is yes, he's going to ask you to serve him. All of the past things you've done, lay it aside. Because guess what? Jesus Christ died for your sins. Even the sins you committed after you were saved. See, I think the, the, the toughest sins I've had to let go of were the, the sins that I committed after I was saved. And I was saved at a young age, so it's not like I was, a, you know, I was saved when I was six. So it's not like I was a heathen out murdering and stealing. Um, but so I grew up most of my life saved. And man, I would just beat myself up because all of those sins, I knew better. I was raised in a pastor's home. All the sins I was committing, I knew they were sins. And so I felt like it was all oh, so much worse. And sometimes I felt like, well, I can't do that because of what I've done. I can't. My sin is so much worse than that person that's saved when they're 40 after, you know, all that stuff because they, they were lost. You expect lost people to sin, but I've been saved. I know better. I want to tell you, Peter wasn't lost when he denied Jesus. He was saved. He even had a good relationship with him. Yet he still denied Jesus. And guess what? Those sins were forgiven just like the sins before your salvation. And see... Sometimes we feel like we have to continue to punish ourselves. Like we committed a sin and we went to God and we asked him for forgiveness. And guess what? He forgives us and we know that. But then it almost feels like it's too easy. I committed this heinous sin against God. And I go to, go to him in prayer and I ask him for forgiveness. And I truly repent and I turn away. But that's it. And so then it feels like we have to have to beat ourselves up, have to just rack ourselves with guilt because I did this awful thing. It really reminds me of 
there's some monks way back in the Middle Ages or whatever. And what they'd do is they'd, they'd carry around whips and they'd whip themselves on the back for penance and things like that because they had the, the sins or the things they'd done, they felt like they needed to beat themselves up to get closer to God. Now, I would say that probably none of y'all are doing that. I hope not. If, if you are, you need some help. Um, but many of us spiritually, emotionally, we're carrying around whips and beating ourselves up for the things in our past. I want to tell you, Jesus Christ died not only for your sins, but the guilt of your sins. And when you go to Him for forgiveness, those sins are forgiven. He wants you to move on. And when we continue to beat ourselves up for the sins we've committed, what that is, whether we want to admit it or not, it's pride. Because my sin is so bad that even God's forgiveness isn't enough that I have to continue to punch myself and make myself feel bad. No! Your sin isn't any worse than Peter's denial. And guess what? Jesus came to him and he says, Peter, do you love me? And Jesus is coming to you today and he says, do you love me? Do you love me more than these? Whatever the these is in your life, whether it's your job, whether it's your friends, whether it's your family, I don't know what it is. But whatever it is, Jesus is asking you today, do you love me more than them? And you're going to have to make a decision. This or that. As Peter came forward and he saw his best friend that he'd betrayed, that he'd turned his back on, he had a chance for reconcilia reconciliation. And I want to say you do too. You don't have to continue living in sin, continue beating yourself up. That's not where Jesus wants you to be. Jesus wants you to have joy and peace. If you don't have joy and peace in your life, something's wrong. Because guess what? In the midst of everything, Christians can still and should still have joy and peace. Even in the midst of COVID, we can still have joy and peace. Even back last year when everybody was, was a flutter and everyone was in a panic, I want to tell you one thing that just blew my mind, and I'm not... I want, I want to just throw this out there. I'm not like an anti-COVID person. I don't think it doesn't exist, okay? just want to make that known. We could die just as easily before COVID as we could during it. All of a sudden, though, now we're face-to-face -face with death, right? Did anybody really think before COVID, oh, I can't die? No. But now all of a sudden, now death is on everybody's mind. That's the only difference. I mean, yeah, COVID is deadly and it's awful. But I could have died before COVID happened too. I still got out and got in my car. I still get out and go hang out with friends. I still go play basketball and volleyball. I want to tell you, a lot of people die on the highway every day. I still drive. Death has always been there, but all of a sudden we come face to face with it. And how many of us, even as Christians, we let that fear of death consume us instead of relying on Jesus? We let the fear of many things, and for some people, I know some people, that fear is the this they're hanging on to. They would rather live in fear than live in Jesus. They would rather live in security than live in Jesus. They would rather live in, in comfort than live in Jesus. Because I want to tell you, serving Christ is not comfortable. In fact, he calls us out of the comfort. Once again, another Peter story. Jesus called Peter out on the water in the middle of the waves, in the middle of the storm. And I know Peter gets a lot of backlash because he took his eyes off the Lord and began to sink. But besides Peter and Jesus, there's not another person to have walked on water. And that was Peter saying, Lord, if you want me to come out, call me. Just call me. And Jesus said, okay, come on. And he did. And I want to tell you how many of us, and don't, don't get me wrong, the waves were still there when, G, when Peter was walking on the water. The only difference was his eyes was on the Lord. Are you sitting safely in the boat today? Have, have you 
run away from God, run away from your calling to hide in the boat, to go to your, what you're comfortable with, to go, as Peter said, I'm going to go fishing. I'm going to go to what I know. I'm going to go to what I'm comfortable with. Is that you today? Are you hiding? Because, Kenny, it's just, that's a lot of work. I don't know. I don't know about y'all, but I've since I've graduated high school, I've gotten a little lazy athletically and just in general. And so sometimes if something's a lot of work, I'm just like, meh, maybe not. And I want to tell you, serving God is a lot of work. Anybody that tells you different is just, just lying. Because guess what? I have to crucify the flesh daily. I have to give up things I want. And see, that's, that's one thing a lot of people don't talk about. Peter, I imagine that Peter wanted to keep fishing. I'm sure he enjoyed that work. I'm sure there's something he wanted to do. And see, serving God means I have to give up my own desires sometimes. So I want to ask you, over this past... Man, we're already four months into 2021. Isn't that crazy? The past four months, have you had to deny yourself anything for Christ? What about this past year? Let's go, let's go all the way back to since when COVID started. Have you had to deny yourself anything to serve God? Because if we don't have to tell ourselves no, then I want to tell you the one you're serving isn't God. It's yourself. Because God puts decisions in front of us that say this or that. Me or your comfort zone. And I want to tell you, if you've been in your comfort zone for the past year and a half and never left it, you're probably not walking with Jesus at the moment. Because Jesus is going to call you out of the ship. Jesus is going to call you out of your comfort zone, out of the fishing, out of the stability, out of the whatever zone you're in. He's going to call you out and say, hey, we get to keep growing. We get to keep moving. God has big plans for you. God has big plans for this church. He doesn't call people. He doesn't lead them to salvation just to leave them where they're at. He calls them to not only grow them, but so they can grow people around them. But we have to make a decision. Jesus or myself. Jesus or my job. Jesus or my sport. Jesus or my family. Whatever is on this other side, you've got to figure out what is more important. And a very simple beginning, and I, I tell this to my youth, youth group all the time, a very simple start is denying yourself some time at home and opening up the Word of God. How much time do we spend in the Bible? How much time do we spend watching the news or on TV? Or I'm a, I'm a big movie person. I love watching movies. Um, how much time do we spend watching movies or playing games or hanging out with friends? How about we, we start small? We don't try to bite off more than we can chew. We start small. We're like, okay, today I'm going to deny myself some time and open up God's word. I'm going to spend time studying his word. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deny myself some time and pray. You know what? I'm going to deny myself the comfort of some conversations and instead put Jesus in those conversations. Because how many times have we seen opportunities that we could talk about Jesus, but it would have been really uncomfortable? Or maybe people were even talking about Jesus and talking about church, but it was unbiblical, and we're like, man, we really don't want to be awkward right now. We really don't want to make things uncomfortable. I don't like confrontation. I'm, oh. I, I apologize for things when someone else has done me wrong. You know, I'm that type of guy. And so I hate confrontation. So there are times that I've just simply walked away when I knew they had salvation wrong simply because I didn't want to make it awkward. How about we deny ourselves some comfort and choose Jesus? But that's up to you. Jesus didn't force Peter. 
He came to him and he says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And Peter says, Lord, you know I do. He says, okay then. Feed my sheep. You love me? Now serve me. So I want to ask you, do you love the Lord today? If the answer is yes, then the follow-up question is, are you serving? Because those go hand in hand. If you love, you serve. There is no true service without first loving Jesus. And if you do love, then you will serve. If you're not serving, you're not loving. Are you serving Jesus today? As the pianist and song leader comes forward and as we stand...